Okay, so the the uh, the book Ivan first little bit Ivan doesn't appear in the in the book, but he he's kind of his shadow is present. All right, this is one of the interesting things about this. Um, well, actually, all the all the books, all the a lot of the characters is their 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 shadow. Their presence is kind of felt, even though they're not directly. Um, you know the central character. We talked about this in the last the last book with um, uh, Kolya and Rakitin uh, and, and Ivan, and you kind of get their presence. And even like Zosima is sort of present throughout the <coughs> Osha in a way. And you get this in the uh, this book with Ivan. So I want to I want to talk about uh, the first four chapters. I don't really want to say too much about the last one uh, not you not you because that's gonna that discussion is gonna carry over pretty quickly into the remainder of that and it's a short it's a short chapter too it's only like what three pages or four pages something like that so um, if you do have a question about it though feel free to feel free to ask um, but I want to what I want to focus on mostly is the, the, the beginning conversation with Grushenka, then the um, conversation with Van Holokov, Lisa, and then finally with Dimitri. <coughs> and I, think, I think these are these. There's enough here to take up the whole the whole time. So, um, but to begin, any questions? Anything about the, this this reading that just really completely puzzled you? Like I don't know why he why he said this because there's a lot of really weird things that happen in this. This part of the uh, the novel, he says a lot of strange things, uh, so we can talk about that if, if you have any questions. Um, any any general or specific questions about things that happen here? Uh huh. So in um, chapter three at the end, where Lee's um, talking goes brushes, crazy, like brushes her nail. Yeah. I just was that in. Yeah, yeah, completely intentional. And, and so then the follow-up question would be, why? Yeah, okay, good, good. Um, anyone want to take a stab at that? Why does, why does Lisa do this? Just attention. She's a little bit of a masochist. She doesn't understand what, like, true, like, love is or having yeah. a very perverted sense of life. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's something about her um, uh, the way that she sees the world, and this, this is what, what, what you get in the couple you know, pages preceding that, that <coughs> final, really it's the final paragraph where, where she slams the door on her finger. But she says that she, um, she, she basically hates Hates the world. She 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 wants. She loves evil and she hates the good. She wants destruction. Um, uh, right. She is. This is on five eighty two of this edition. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, she she talks about how she wants to burn burn the house down. Um, Alyosha says, "You take evil for good. It's a momentary crisis. Perhaps it comes from your former illness." And she says, so after all, you do despise me. She kind of wants to be despised. She, she, want, she wants Alyosha to, to hold something against her. Um, and, and, and I think it, it, I mean, it's a really complicated, this is a super complicated um, psychological uh, drama here, but it's, she kind of wants um, Alyosha to be, to be jealous of her, to, to kind of <coughs> despise her, to... Um, Right, it, you get some of this. Like, if we if we get married and I start writing letters to other people, you you will you'll you'll be the one to even deliver the letters. He, he says, and and um, uh, and I think what she what she kind of is looking for is um, a type of a type of love that is like <laughs> proven in the fact that um, someone else is going to be jealous over. So there's like this like resistance. There's this like fight. And it's because they're fighting 
that they care so much about me in a way. And and um, it's it's as if you don't if you if you despise me. Remember, this is what um, Alyosha says about Ivan. If you despise someone, it kind of means you have to care about them a little bit first. Because if you didn't care about it completely, you wouldn't despise them. Does that like I don't hold it against. Um, uh, a bird that's... Did I tell you about the bird that pooped on me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I can't remember what class I told that in. Uh, but like, I don't hold it against that bird, um, right? So I don't, I don't like despise it or, or loathe it for, for that very reason. But um, I think she, she's looking for someone to um, despise her because it kind of is a mark a little bit that someone actually kind of cares. Um, there's some form of attachment or love. And so it's this really... Um, twisted, perverted sense of desire for love, which is proven through like resistance. It's proven through like turmoil. Um, and I think this is sometimes also why, although it's tangentially related, but why people love drama. Like it, it, it because it kind of makes, it makes things kind of exciting and it makes it, it makes it seem like you, um, you have something to do, something to, to, to that's something that's worthwhile. Uh, 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 and so I think this is, it's a, it's a slightly um, twisted form of a desire for, um, for love. <coughs> but, but I think Lisa's fundamental problem is that she uh, has, as she, she says towards the very end of the chapter, she has come to loathe the world. So I'll just read this. Um, uh, very bottom of 584. You know, Alyosha, you know, I'd like to, and then she pauses, Alyosha, save me. She suddenly jumped up from the couch, rushed to him, and held him tightly in her arms. Save me, she almost groaned. Would I tell anyone in the world what I told you? But I told you the truth, the truth, the truth. I, I'll kill myself because everything is so loathsome to me. I don't want to live because everything is so loathsome to me. Everything is so loathsome, so loathsome. Alyosha, why, why don't you love me at all? And Alyosha says, I do love you. Part, part of her problem is that she doesn't know how to like really see it. She doesn't know how to like really see the love or, or, or to receive it is one way to think of it. Um, so, so I think her, her primary problem is that she doesn't see the world um, anymore and this is there's a change that occurs in her um, both psychologically but also physically what does she what does she do here she jumps up from the couch and rushes to Alyosha why is that interesting for Lisa to do she's paralyzed. because she's perilous not anymore um, right so go back to the beginning of this um, uh, this whole discussion with uh, when right when Alyosha comes to Madame Holocaust house remember Madame Holocaust is Lisa's mom <laughs> Remember that, and 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 Lee and and Madame Holocaust says says <coughs> this to Alyosha, you know. Oh, I'm so glad that you and Lisa. Lisa was just a little girl. She was just pretending and playing when she asked when you guys were agreeing to get married, and and that was just childish, foolish, you know, little schoolgirl dreams. And we're glad we're past that now. Um, and here's what Madame Holocaust says. Uh, You've understood, of course, that it was all just the playful, childish fancy of a sick girl who had sat for so long in a chair. Thank God she's walking now. The new doctor Katya invited from Moscow uh, for that unfortunate brother of yours. Yada, yada. He came and I paid him 50 rubles. And Anyway, she, she's, she's walking. And this, I think, is a significant point. Um, because what was, what was Madame Holokov really wanting for Elisa for like the first... 300 pages of the book or so, she was wanting her daughter to walk. And now the daughter is walking. And who was she wanting to like have, the, have healed her daughter? Zosima. And so it's, it's kind of like she was praying for this miracle that her daughter would walk. And it's kind of strange. The daughter's walking now. Zosima's dead. The daughter's walking. And it looks like this goes back to that original question uh, from the beginning of the book that does the miracle spring from faith or faith from the, uh, the, 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 the miracle? Can you, it's as if, if a miracle happens, but you, 
are looking at the world through the eyes of, <coughs> as, as we'll see later uh, from Dimitri, a Bernard. Uh, we'll talk about what a Bernard is, but it's sort of like a, this me mechanistic, scientistic sort of view of the world. Um, you just won't see miracles. Miracles aren't real for you if that's how you're seeing the world. Um, you, can have a, you can have a girl that's lame that, gets, that, that recovers, but it's not, it's not going to be a miraculous event. You can have someone that you know, is a murderer and they repent and they completely change their life, but that's not going to be a miracle, a moral miracle, because and then you can just appeal to some form of psychological uh, like account and say, oh no, there's nothing special in that. That's just, and you you kind of reduce it in a way. Um, so I think that's that's at stake here too. She recovers, uh, that is Lisa recovers, but she loses something very important because she's gotten well. Remember what made her so perceptive of other people earlier in the book. Why was she so perceptive of other people? Why does Alyosha think she was like a spiritual master? Do you remember that? When they were talking about Snagirio, the captain, and, and, and she says, aren't we, aren't we looking down on him by judging him in this way and speculating his motives and, and, and all that sort of stuff? And, and Alyosha says, only someone like you could have that insight because... Because, because you really understand the real depth of, of, of suffering. You understand what it's like to be the recipient of other people's like charity works and how, how demeaning it could feel to receive other people's charity. And so she has this real experience of suffering. And I think there's something happening in this, this, this chapter with Lisa gets well in one way, but she, she loses something in, in that. Um, uh huh? Like, like Demi um, Dimitri? Yeah, 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 exactly. And so I think, I think the characterization between Lisa and Dimitri is, is really, that's a really stark contrast. Um, and uh, <coughs> no joy. Uh, um, we'll just call it Intense joy. The joy that Dimitri has for the, for for her life is intense, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna read this section because this is, um, I think, the most moving passage of the whole book. So I'm gonna read it in, in full. It, it is going to. Um, it's it's an awesome awesome passage. Uh, but Lisa looks at the world and she she sees it as uh, <coughs> um, loathsome and. One way to think about what she's doing um, throughout the uh, throughout the, the the whole chapter is it's a form of rebellion. She hates existence, um, and even her slamming of her finger in the door is kind of like this. I hate the fact that I hate existence, right? I mean, it's like, why can't I find anything joyful in existence? Um, and 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 she. She wants Alyosha to save her. Is, is sort of what she, what she's, what she, she recognizes, and she doesn't want to be this way. She wants to find joy in, in this, but she can't. And one of the questions that that uh, that arose from this time reading it is maybe the reason this is the case is because she doesn't, oops, she doesn't suffer. Um, we'll we'll say. Uh, um, Externally, you have to suffer in some sense. Like it might, this is maybe as as you think. To be human is to suffer. You have to suffer. Uh, if you don't suffer by, you know, being crippled, you're, and you don't suffer by being hungry, and you don't suffer by yada yada. You're going to suffer in a psychological sense. You're going to suffer the the meaning of existence. You're going to think if there's nothing else that I'm suffering, at least like existence will be a suffering thing for me, uh, which. Kind of goes back to this point that we were saw in in the Republic, um, a little bit about luxury. Something about when things are very comfortable, um, the meaning of things kind of um, weakens. It, it you kind of get a little 
uh, you get you, you you feel when everything's going perfectly well. Sometimes you feel very <coughs> relaxed. Right? It's a strange, it's a strange thing. Like uh, it's it's in those moments of of intensity, um, either intense lows or intense highs, um, that you feel stretched, uh, and it's it's kind of right in that middle ground. So at the very least, I think what what's happening is. She recognizes that she needs to suffer, um, uh, and 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 here though the suffering amounts to this, this suffering that's a hatred, uh, a hatred of, of of her suffering. Where I think before what's fascinating is she doesn't despise. I mean, you correct me if you find a passage about this, but she doesn't despise being in the wheelchair. Her mom does. Her mom thinks this is a great like deficiency of, of her existence. Only if she were not crippled will she, would she be such a wonderful, happy girl. Um, but I get the impression that she loves Alyosha. She she really finds something meaningful. She she finds like the real meaning of of, of of life that someone loves her despite the fact that like everyone else is just pandering to her and, and treating her like you know a charity case. And and here is someone who actually loves me. And now she kind of loses that. And I think I think you get the contrast. And one of the one of the things at, at play in, in all of this is what, what accompanies or what precedes this change? Who visits her? Yvonne. Yvonne. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, right, and, um, and he's sort of the mark of, <coughs> of rebellion. Um, uh, right, and there's also someone else who's responsible for this, and that's her mom. Uh, uh, who, who, uh, you know, <laughs> living with her would make me view the world in that way too, probably, um, or at least it would be very tempting to. Uh, and and I and I think this is another case over and over and over again, another case of a uh, a wee one who's suffering, and it's suffering because of a karamatsal, right? Um, and suffering because of her her parent, right? Her origin. Uh, right. This is this this is. Um, I don't think a, an accident here. Right after she gives this horrible, hor she says, "I had this horrible, horrible thought, this really destructive thought, and it's this really bizarre, super bizarre thought about right, the crucifixion." That she said, "I once heard this story that you know the Jews crucify the four-year-old, and and I'm sitting there eating pineapple compote, which I think is like a little." drink, slushy drink sort of thing, something like that, which is like, what the hell is going on here? Uh, but I think it's the perversity. I think part of what she, what she represents in this case is the, what we, as, as um, uh, what we often are attracted to is the, 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 the disorder of things. If you, once again, can't help make this comment, Augustine's Confessions, why did he love the stealing of the pears? He gave this example, he stole pears in his youth. Why did he do that? Was it because he wanted the pears, they were, they were tasty? You know, it's like, the pears were crappy, the, the pears weren't ripe, they were bad pears. Why did, why did I do it? Because it was wrong, because there's something exciting about violating what shouldn't be violated. And, and, and what Lisa is, and this is why it's really hard to, to read uh, this part of the story, is she's saying this is a gear that, that, that we have. We, we often find it exciting to just do what's wrong because it's wrong. Um, we, can, we, can go, <coughs> we can go to that, that level. And it, and it could be that, I mean, she even proposes, it's not just that it happens, but that and this is, I think, the point is like, it's sort of doubly wrong that she's there just eating pineapple compote, watching this. Um, and, and, and I think the, the idea is that like, what, what's really attractive in, in sin, fundamentally, is this overstepping of the boundary. It's the rejection of the good. And so the more like, deviant from the good it is, the more it becomes really truly what sin is at, at its heart. It's the rejection of the good, it's the perversion of the good. Um, 
Uh, and so, so I think this is, this is what rebellion kind of looks like. It's a turning from the good, but not a, not a bland turning from the good, but a real like, degradation of it. Um, and, and I think part of, part of this, this whole stage is this is what it, this is what it can, can come to, right? And, and there is an attraction to that, that just because something's forbidden, you kind of want to eat the apples just because you're told not to eat it. Just because you know you're not supposed to do this, you kind of feel the excitement of doing it. Um, and, and, and you kind of get tormented by that as well. Uh, and that's the situation I think she, she's going to find herself in. But it's, it's only through this, um, this character that you see that. Um, uh, so I think she's just a tormented soul. A tormented soul by wanting to see joy, but knowing that she doesn't. Um, Wanting to, to make the pronouncement, this is an interesting um, observation. Uh, God looks at the world after he makes it and he pronounces it's good. And, and then you say, okay, but Adam and Eve, they, they botched it. And, and we all continue to botch it. What, does God take the pronouncement back and says, okay, no, 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 wait, I was wrong. It's not good. It's bad. Does he do that? Does it, is it still the same pronouncement? He looks at the world and he says, it is good. Does he do that? He does. It's just really radical. It's kind of, we don't really want, it's almost like, no, you can't look at this and say that it's good. But the pronouncement is, no, it's good. Lisa is the person who says, I want to look at the world and all of its ugliness and be able to say somehow it's good. But I just can't. And that's why she says, Alyosha, save me. Uh, I think she wants, she wants to see the world as good. Um, Ivan wants to see the world as good, uh, but, he, but he can't. He, he rebels, he, he resists. Um, uh, and so I think this is, this, is, uh, this is the real deep existential crisis of, of Ivan, of Lisa, probably of, of a lot of us when we experience this type of evil. We kind of want to say, God, no, don't say this is, don't look at the world and say the world is good because this stuff is in the world. You can't say that it's good. Uh, and I think the, the radical thing is Dimitri, um, who, who's, who's capable of looking at the world, and he can look at the world and he can say, um, it, is, it is good. In fact, it, it might be better than anything you could have ever hoped for. Um, and it's Dimitri who can say this. So, so we should jump to Dimitri, um, although there's a lot of other things we could say about Lisa. Um, and we could talk about the ailing foot of Madame Halakala. But we gotta, we gotta, we gotta move on. Okay, so this is this is Dimitri. Early on, the very beginning of the book, we uh, this this the, the 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 book for today, which I think is ordered book eleven. Is that what we're on? Yeah. Um, Grushinka and Alyosha are, are talking, and Grushinka says, "Yeah, I went to visit uh, 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 Ivan, and and he said this crazy thing. I I thought he was like being intelligent, but then I thought like maybe he's, maybe he's crazy. What was he talking about?" He kept talking about this wee one, this, this baby, this child. <laughs> I mean, so, so Grushinka, like over here is Dmitri talking about. So it's pretty clear that what Dostoevsky wants us to, to think about Ivan's experience in prison is this, this wee one continues to like be present in Dmitri's life. The cry, he keeps hearing the cry. He keeps asking the question. He, he's, it's not a one-time like fleeting moment of his, of his, of this dream. It it's it really it really has stuck. It's stuck in his, stuck in his soul. And so then here we go. We get to Dimitri. Uh, uh, Dimitri is uh, talks to Rakitin, and Rakitin is uh, telling him all these great ideas about um, well, maybe maybe you maybe you didn't really do it because you were insane. And you're crazy, and so you're not responsible for this. And and the doctor was hired from Moscow to try to prove that Dmitri was crazy, so he's not responsible for it. And Dmitri's real concern isn't that that would be an admission that he physically did the murder, but he's not morally responsible. He doesn't really care about that. What he cares about is that he would lose God if that were were the story that was told. All right, um, because why would Dimitri lose God if that were the story? Because he would lose his sense of guilt. He would lose his sense of 
of being responsible. And once he lost the sense of being responsible, he would lost that source of what made him come to, to, to this recognition of God. And, and as we'll see, ultimately, this joy that we had in the world. Um, so he doesn't want to be relinquished of his guilt. He wants it to be, I mean, it'd be nice if he could be proven not to be the murderer, but he doesn't want to be relinquished of the guilt. Very strange position. Probably no convict has ever been in this position before. Because um, you might think, well, you either did it, in which case you're guilty, or you didn't do it, in which case you're not guilty. He's saying, no, no, I didn't do it, but I'm still guilty. You're like, what the hell does that mean? Uh, uh, right, only, only um, a Karamozov could say this. So, so let, me, let me read what, what he eventually says to Alyosha, because this is, this is at like the pinnacles, I think, of like a, like a, like a spiritual ecstasy in, in Dostoevsky. Um, okay, this is on page 591 of this edition. Uh, right, kind of right in the middle. And he, he, uh, he says, let me tell you about something that I haven't told anyone because I knew no one else would understand this but you. So he begins, Rakitin wouldn't understand this, which is also a phrase, I know I, sh I should just read it and not comment on it, but that's also a phrase that Grushinka uses earlier on in the novel when they're talking and she's like, shut up, or shut up, Rakitin, you won't understand anything that's happening between Alyosha and me right now. <coughs> Even though, as you, as you are starting to see, Rakitin's a very educated man, he knows a lot, uh, but he is blind to, to a lot because of that fact. Because he knows a lot, um, he, he, he's blind, I think, to, to, a, to a deeper understanding or a higher, depending on how you want to think of it, understanding of, of things. It's like if you become the master of the shadows in the cave, you get like wedded to the cave, and therefore you become blind to anything other than the shadows. Uh, and I think that's kind of like Rakitin. Um, okay, Rakitin wouldn't understand this. He began all in a sort of rapture, as it were. But you, you will understand everything. That's why I have been thirsting for you. You see, for a long time, I've been wanting to say many things to you here within these peeling walls, but I've kept silent about the most important thing. The time didn't seem to have come yet. I've been waiting till this last time to pour out my soul to you. Brother, in these two past months, I've sensed a new man in me. A new man has arisen in me. He was shut up inside me, but if it weren't for this thunderbolt, uh, remember the, 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 the phrase, the, the little, little um, proverb, that if, unless, the, thunder, unless the, the, the thunderbolt, or unless there's thunder, the peasant won't cross himself, right? Um, if it weren't for this thunderbolt, this new man never would have appeared. Frightening, what do I care if I spend 20 years pounding out iron ore in the mines? I'm not afraid of, of that uh, at all, but I'm afraid of something else now, uh, that this risen man not depart from me. So he basically says, you know, I've come to uh, this, this experience of this new man, this resurrection, only because of the thunderbolt. It's kind of exactly like the prodigal son who, who has this <coughs> deep understanding for the, 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 the father because of having lost everything. Whereas, unfortunately, the, the elder son ha has, has retained the inheritance, has, it, maybe there's a lot of other parables that you can compare this to, has buried his fortune, but because of that, it doesn't like, mean anything to, to him. Um, and so the experience of the person who squandered it is this deep experience of what the value of that is. And when it's returned then, when it's, the coin <coughs> is found, however you want to think of all these different parables, when it's found, that is the case when you, you really understand um, the, the depth of it. And so, so he, he's thankful for this thunderbolt. He's thankful that he's in prison because if it weren't for that, there wouldn't be this new man. There wouldn't be this new, new soul in him. Um, he's not afraid of being proven um, guilty of the murder. He's not afraid of going to Siberia. What is he afraid of? That he loses the sense of this new man that, 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 that has risen in him. Right, that in a sense that he'll lose the sense of his, his guilt uh, because it was the sense of his guilt that was the source of this, this new man. Even there in the mines, underground, you can remember Madame Holocaust told him to go to the mines, and it's the great irony is that he is perhaps 
now willing to go to the mines um, to find gold. Uh, all right, um, uh, so even, even in underground, you can find a human heart in the convict and murderers standing next to you. Uh, and you can be close to him, so you can find God in the murderer next to you, in the, in the what, what, what have you, the, the tax collector, right? The, uh, the prostitute, the, all the people that Christ brought to him. Um, you can find God there. It's, it's, it's too radical for me to say, um, but it, it's, it's been said by other people. So I'll let those other people and those other, those other books say it. Um, right? But you can find God even on the ground, in the murderer, right? In the convict. Standing next to you, you can be close to him because there too it's possible to live and love and suffer. You can revive and resurrect the frozen heart in this convict. You can look after him for ye- yeah. You can look after him for years and finally bring up from the cave into the light. That sounds familiar. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't assign the book for that reference to the the the, the cave allegory, but. It, it's certainly a nice cherry on top, but um, I didn't even know that was in there because in the other translation, it, it doesn't have that. It doesn't make reference to the cave, I don't believe. Um, all right, so you can finally bring up some, some poor, some poor Grushenka, some poor soul with your onion from, from the, because uh, there are onions underground in Siberia too, right? Um, from, from the cave, you can, you can draw them into the light. Uh, a suffering conscious, uh, consciousness, or you can draw them into this suffering consciousness. Uh, uh, you can revive an angel, resurrect a hero. And there are many of them. There are hundreds. And we're all guilty for them. Why did I have a dream about a wee one at such a moment? Why is the wee one poor? It was a prophecy to me at that moment. Is uh, It's for the wee one that I will go. And then this links up exactly with what we were talking about last, uh, last class. Because everyone is guilty for everyone else. For all are we ones, right? All, all, like, like you see, we saw this in the mother of, of Kolya, right? Um, she's a child. She, she's just a child. And, and here, Dimitri has this deep, profound insight. For all are we ones. Uh, because they're all little children. And big, because there are little children and big children. Right? It's as if you can look at the big child. You can look at the child and you can say, oh, forgive them. They, they know not what they do. And you can look at the big children and you can still say to them, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because all are, 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 are children in this, in this sense. Um, all people are we ones. I'll go for all of them because there must be someone who will go for all of them. Uh, this, this is like... Um, someone has to go for all, all these suffering children, and and it's and it's like we're called to it because, or it, if we're responsible for it, we're called to go for all of them. And it turns out that there was one who who sort of innocently went to Siberia to suffer for all the wee ones, uh, right? All all of all of his children, um, uh, right? And it was a taking on the guilt without any sense of having committed the murder, but willing to, to, be, to be subjected to the guilt of it, right? Um, and this is Dimitri saying, to take up, I think he's saying, the most positive he's saying, to take up your cross is to really take up that one cross, which is like the cross of everyone. And it's this recognition that like, all are responsible for this. You, 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 go, you go for all, um, if you go at all. Uh, I, I didn't kill father, but I must go. I accept. All of this came to me here within these peeling walls. And there are many, there are hundreds of them underground with hammers in their hands. Oh, yes, we'll be in chains. There will be no freedom. But then in our great <coughs> grief, we will arise once more into joy, without which it's not possible for man to live. And so I think Demetrius is saying, you can't live without joy. It's not possible. <laughs> Right? He was on the verge of, of killing himself out of this loss of joy, which was like Grushinka. He found a new joy, but it wasn't primarily in Grushinka. It was in the suffering children. And how do you find joy in the suffering children? It's in this recognition that he can offer his life for them. And it's this, it's this great sense of purpose. Lisa, I think, can't experience the joy of life where Dimitri is able to experience a joy in life, even in the, the midst of suffering. Um, 
Uh, right, so this is, this is a really, I think, in, intense um, claim that's being made. Um, all, uh, we will arise once more into joy without which it's not possible for man to live or for God to be, for God gives joy. Right, uh, so the link between believing in God and seeing the world with the eyes of joy go completely hand in hand. It's his prerogative, uh, a great one. Lord, let man dissolve in prayer. How would I be there underground without God? Rakitin's line, if God is driven from the earth, we'll meet him underground. It's impossible for a convict to be without God. Even more impossible for a non-convict. And then for the depths of, uh, sorry, and then from the depths of the earth, we, the men underground, will start singing a tragic hymn to God in whom there is joy. Hail to God and his joy. I love him. Uh, I think what he's saying is the people that are going to keep God alive in the world are those that have like fallen into Siberia, those that, that are completely like the, 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 the great sinners, the great wretches that recognize the only possible way to live is to hold on to God. Anything else at, at, that, at that level, like you can't, you can't persist. No, no amount of medicine, no amount of, of, of science, no amount of knowledge will, will make life worth living without God. And so I think he's saying only the people that are capable, uh, and he calls these the convicts, right? The convicts, the people that are, the people that have been, that have um, been guilty, which I think you could say is a sinner, uh, is where, is where the, the, the hymn, the tragic hymn to God begins, um, which is probably like the season of Lent, right? Uh, uh, all right. And so it's this really intense attempt to bring together suffering guilt and joy like how can those three all go together how is that possible um uh and i think what 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 he's trying to do here is he's trying to bring that bring that on on the table and then he goes on because this is this is a, a, a like a little further articulation so let me just finish this because it's um it gets it gets pretty cool here um Meacher was almost breathless uttering his wild <laughs> speech he grew pale. His lips trembled. Tears poured from his eyes. Like, a, like only a Karamazov could, could get this like passionate. Um, no, life is full. There is life underground too, he began again. You wouldn't believe, Alexei, how I want to live now. What thirst to exist and to be conscious has been born in me precisely within these peeling walls. This is once again like an articulation of the, the existential situation of the prodigal son. Um, Right, the desire is so strong. Uh, Rakitin doesn't understand it. R right, Rakitin doesn't understand this type of joy for life. All he wants is to build his house and rent out rooms, which I believe is a reference to like the Tower of Babel made earlier on throughout the whole thing. He just wants to build his his perfect palace, um, right? Uh, more, his perfect, so to speak, moral palace. Um, uh, but I was waiting for you. And besides, what is suffering? I'm not afraid of it, even if it's numberless. I'm not afraid of it now. I was before. You know, maybe I won't even give any answers in court. <coughs> and it seems to me there's so much strength in me now that I can overcome everything, all suffering, only in order to say and tell myself every moment, I am. Different translations have I exist, but I like I am, because who else pronounces I am? Jesus and God, yeah, both the, the, Jesus and God. But then they're, they're kind of the same, just different. I don't want to get into those complexities right now. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, I, I am. In a thousand torments, I am, right? The, the joy is to be found in existence. Like, like, like the, 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 the proclamation on is existence good or existence bad is a second, it's sort of like this secondary question. There's something more primary. It's the goodness of existence. And, and to, really, to really be able to get to that level, to see regardless of, of how painful it, it is, there's still some goodness there. Uh, because it's fundamentally um, love that gets to that level of existence. So he goes, he goes on. Um, uh, right. Uh, uh, In a thousand torments, I am. Withering under torture, but I am. Locked in a tower, but still I exist. I see the sun. 
And if I don't see the sun, this is like great platonic imagery here. So I, 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 right, I, I exist, uh, I see the sun. And even if I don't see the sun, even if I'm stuck in the cave and all I'm looking at is shadows, still I know it is. I know the sun is. Even if I don't see it, even if I can't always feel it, I can feel it because I know that it's missing. Like, like that, that longing is in some ways an acknowledgement, an affirmation of it. Um, and so there can be joy even in the absence of it, the longing for it, because it's, 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 you can only long for something that, that um, exists, and therefore it's, it's, it's a connection that you have to it. Um, Alyosha, my cherub, all these philosophies are killing me. Devil take them. Brother Ivan, and he goes and talks about Brother Ivan. Um, uh, but I, I think this, this is the great insight of, um, of Dimitri, is that uh, he has found God through his death. And as soon as that death is taken away from him, uh, he'll forget God. And I think this, is, this links up a little bit with Lisa, right? Um, as soon as this suffering is taken from her, she, she sort of forgets God. Um, it's 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 really it's really easy to think that in in the moments of of a real intense trial you recognize the utter need for God, but when everything seems to be going peachy, the need for God kind of right becomes stale. And I and I and I think this is why the convict is is like the mark of like the real intense believer because the convict's need for God is so strong that he couldn't live without God <coughs> where Rakitin <coughs> thinks he can live without God Dr. Jager unfortunately thinks he can live without God although he doesn't want to he still sometimes does um, right? but, but Dimitri knows there's no possible way for me to live without God and it's because I've, I've like tried it it's like the prodigal son knows I can't live without the father because I've tried it um, and, and so I think that that's where the joy can be had is in this the suffering that one has because it's a reminder, a return to that, that, that original love that was there. Um, and so the suffering gets linked, linked up with um, something. And so the suffering can be something that can be experienced with joy. Um, so it's, um, it's pretty radical. Anyway, we have questions. Feel free to ask questions, but if you need to go, you can